NFT. So the purpose of the ISNA webinar is to hold the seminar by the prominent researchers. And uh, I think Bill Gates is the, one of the most suitable prominent researchers to hold, to give us the seminar today. So before starting, I'd like to invite Petra Sofron, uh, Professor Petra Sofronis, the director of ISNA, uh, to, to, set, to bring us a few words at the beginning. So Petros. Petros, please unmute. All right. Yes. Good morning, Hiroshige. Uh, good evening, uh, <laughs> Bilge. Uh, I would like uh, to welcome uh, everybody from all over the world, Japan, United States, and Europe, and Australia, to this uh, uh, Eisner Seminar Series. Uh, the Eisner Seminar Series is a distinguished series that we have uh, in our institute uh, in order to showcase uh, our activities and at the same time to receive information from distinguished scientists uh, on uh, the cutting uh, edge uh, research that is being pursued around the world so that we can interact, uh, we can uh, intermingle and uh, come up uh, with uh, the best uh, research uh, ideas and uh, proposals and future engagement and interactions. This is uh, the, the, the series. Usually the speakers in this series uh, are um, international authorities in their areas of expertise. Uh, they are leaders of the academic community, leaders of uh, the professional society community, leaders from uh, national laboratories uh, and also sometimes uh, leaders from uh, government uh, agencies that uh, deal with science and technology and education. So, and uh, today I'm, I'm honored, we are honored in Eisner to have uh, Professor Bill Gay Yildiz from MIT to deliver this uh, seminar in, in a way that uh, will help us invigorate this series even further. Bilge, on behalf of my colleagues of Eisner, we thank you. We thank you for having accepted. And now I'll pass the torch to our colleague, Professor Matsumoto, in order to introduce you. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Professor Sofronis, for your very kind introduction. And it's my honor to be able to participate and, and share my work. And I look forward to the discussions. OK, thank you, Petros, and thank you, Bilge. And I thank Bill Gates. I also thank Bill Gates uh, that you accepted uh, the seminar. The, the seminar, and I also thank all the people attending today uh, to the seminar. Uh, as mentioned by Petros, a uh, lot of people attending from U.S., from Japan, from Korea, from Australia, uh, from many other countries. I thank you very much for. Uh, the participation from all over the world. So now it is time uh, for the seminar to start. But before that, I'd like to briefly speak uh, uh, Professor Yudis. So Bilge Yudis is now a professor in the nuclear science and engineering and the material science and engineering department at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where she leads the laboratory for electroceramic, electrochemical interfaces. Uh, Bill Gay received her PhD at MIT in 2003. She worked at Algon National Laboratory then, MIT, as an assistant professor and now professor at the MIT and take the leadership at MIT, including the Low Carbon Energy Center on Materials and Energy and Extreme Environments. Um, <clears throat> As a, one of the result of her permanent work is that she received many awards, including Algon Pace Setter, ANS Outstanding Teaching, NSS Career, IUM Lesomia Awards, the ECS Charles Tobias Young Investigator, and the ASARS Ross Confini Party Awards and many awards. I think one of the, the awards is based on the collaboration with 
Eisenhower Kish University. And now she is the vice president and president elect of the International Society on Solid State Ionics. As far as I know, uh, Bilge will be the youngest and first female president of the SSI society. And my impression, I assume yours as well, is that she is always conducting cutting edge research on solid state ionics and electronic materials and devices. Today's seminar of Bill Gay is also the frontier study. Accordingly, many people are waiting for her seminar and I'd like to pass the screen and microphone to Bill Gay. So now, uh, Bill Gay, the screen and microphone are yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Hiroshige. I really appreciate your very kind introduction. And again, it's my honor to be able to participate in these webinar series. And, and on one hand, it's difficult not to be able to travel and, and interact in person, but also maybe the, these are new opportunities to be able to exchange more often because we don't have to travel. So yeah, I, I really look forward to the discussion at the end of the seminar and, and feel free to ask any questions you have on the topic that I will share. So with that, let me start sharing my screen and I hope it will work. Do you see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay, so I will go ahead then. Yeah, again, thank you so much for, for having me to share our work and, and many of you from Eisner know me on my work related to energy conversion materials. And, and what I will share this time is new work in our lab, more so in the last um, couple of years, where we have started studying energy efficient hardware and materials for analog computing, for brain-inspired computing. And you will see that there are many analogies between these devices that we are working on and energy storage and conversion devices. So it's not too far from my core, but a different application that we have been motivated in the last few years. And, and these will be devices that can serve as artificial synapses and the um, principles will be based on ion motion, including protons and, and oxygen. Okay. So we are motivated to look at this field because there is growing interest and growing potential impact of machine learning algorithms in different applications ranging from image recognition, voice recognition, to healthcare, to security. And, and so it is really a growing field, but together with it, which is grow, what is also growing is the energy demand in being able to apply these algorithms on real life problems. And if we use current computing systems in order to implement those algorithms or current computing systems to be able to mimic certain aspects of, of artificial intelligence or brain-like computing, we then run into huge uh, power consumption. And that is six orders of magnitude, order of six orders of magnitude, greater than what we humans consume for processing the same data. And, and as introduced, I'm both in the nuclear and in the material science department, so I tend to joke that in order to recognize images of dogs from low resolution photos, you need to run a modular nuclear reactor. So it, it's really, really like very um, high energy consumption going on with these algorithms. And the core reason for this is the current computing architecture which separates the processing unit from the memory unit. And there, the data exchange between these two units is causing both time and, and too much energy uh, that is needed for the computation. So there are alternatives to this existing approach that we call the von Neumann architecture or the bottleneck in von Neumann that is the communication between the processing and the memory units. 
and alternatives that can combine the processing and memory in a single architecture. So these architectures can take the form of what we call physical neural networks to emulate the connectivity of neurons through synapses in the biological brain. And so the goal is to be able to then come up with units that can serve as synapses that combine processing and memory in such a network architecture. So these connections, the building blocks that, that form these connections in a physical neural network can take different forms. And one class of such connections is what we call resistive switching um, devices. Okay, so what are resistive switching devices? So you can also see them referred to as resistive random access memory, RERAM or RRAM. These are non-volatile random access memory devices whose resistance changes with electrical history that we apply to the material. And by using these materials or devices, you can obtain either binary or analog computing. So for example, on the left, that is like multiple resistance states that you can stimulate by electrical history, and you can obtain either binary or multiple state, and the latter would give you analog computing. So if you look at the left curve, this is, let's say a binary example where we are applying voltage, that is the red curve that we will trace. And let me turn on my laser pointer. And at a certain voltage, the resistance suddenly increases and follows this green curve, oh, sorry, um, decreases and follows this green curve, which is now your lower resistance. And after another voltage of different polarity, it goes back to the high resistance state. So it gives you an on and off, right? Binary, and it's non-volatile. Alternatively, you can use these devices for analog behavior. That is, you don't have just on and off or zero and one, but you can have a continuum of states. And so here, what we are looking at is sending voltage pulses to a material and changing its conductance after each pulse permanently. And by reversing the pulse polarity, we can also reverse the conductance. And so both binary and analog behavior is possible. And in context of those physical neural networks, the continuum of multiple conductance states that we obtain in this pulsing mode can represent the node weights in a physical neural network. So those would be analogs of synaptic strengths in the biological neural networks. And at the same time, it allows for computation in memory because both the processing and the storage of the processed data is in the same unit. Okay, so there are a number of resistive switching mechanisms that have been explored in the literature and in applications. And, and so I will briefly describe these three that are most widely studied and used, and I'll then introduce the fourth one that is newer. Okay, so the first one that I put on the top left here is based on formation of a metal conducting filament in an insulating solid electrolyte. And the formation of this metal conducting filament is electrochemically driven. So you apply a voltage difference that electrochemically can electromigrate these metal um, atoms to form a dendrite that becomes your bridge that gives you the higher conductance state. And without the bridge, you have only the insulating state. Okay. And alternative or let's say similar to that, which is also electrochemically driven, is another filamentary mechanism, which is not made of metal filaments like on the left, but made of oxygen vacancies which change the local electronic structure and gives rise to a conducting zone, which are also called conductive filaments. And so you are electrochemically 
moving oxygen ions out of the metal oxide into the top metal electrode, and that leaves behind an oxygen vacancy rich zone. In very insulating IK dielectric materials, these become typically very localized zones, and that's why we call them conducting filaments. And the third mechanism is based on phase change. So again, it's voltage driven, but now the process is joule heating that changes the phase of a given composition from an insulating to a conducting phase. So a fourth one that we have started exploring more recently, both us and, and the field, is based on intercalation of small ions into an insulating material. So, and I will explain more about this in the next, um, in more than half of this talk, but overall, again, at a higher level, it's electrochemically driven motion of ions from a reservoir into a medium that we want to electronically switch, and it's reversible. Okay, so what are we trying to obtain from these resistive switches in context of brain-inspired computing. So brain is very complex and, and I know little about it to, to claim anything meaningful, but certain aspects of the synaptic behavior is essential to capture to enable such analog computing, okay? And, and so what happens is that every time uh, voltage or electrical pulse arrives through a neuron to a synapse that releases these neurotransmitters, small cations such as calcium, potassium, sodium, and, and they release and transfer to the following neuron, builds a potential and fires the following neuron. But the, the chemical change in this neuron is then associated with a change in the ease of signal transmission that follows. So the more stimuli, the more pulse stimuli that you send to the neuron, the easier the signal transmission becomes. And this literally correlates to a change in the conductance of the synapse, okay? So let's look at data taken from biological synapses on the right. And so what's shown here, to start with, let's say at time before zero, the conductance of the synapse is taken as unity relative. And then the different colored data correspond to conductance after sending a certain number of pulses of a certain height of voltage to, to the synapse. And so you can see if you don't send any voltage pulse, the conductivity doesn't change. If you send a few pulses, the conductivity changes but decays, so you forget. And if you send more and more pulses, the conductivity beca change becomes permanent and it actually increases. So you're like physically changing the synapse and making the signal transmission easier. So in the biological synapse, this is taking place via ions. In, in device applications, there are these different mechanisms and we will come back to the ions, okay? So at least this behavior, permanent change in the synaptic conductance is essential to capture for data processing like in the biological neural networks, okay? So this is then one example of such a device that was reported nearly 10 years ago where they are using this metal filament mechanism and they're sending voltage pulses to an insulating layer through which they are forming metal filaments and after a certain number of voltage pulses, the conductance of this artificial synapse changes permanently. And that's similar to the data that I've shown to you from the biological synapse. And so this is the behavior that we call potentiation, long-term potentiation. That is long-term permanent change in the physical property, in the conductance of the synapse. And at the least, this ought to be captured for trying to emulate this synaptic behavior in, in inorganic devices for computing. So, as we said, in the brain, we are working with these small cations that 
transport from one neuron to the other and change the local conductance. And nevertheless, the electrolyte medium is liquid and, and organic matter there, so it's not quite conducive directly to putting it in a computer. So in principle, then, you, using such small cations and even expanding to those beyond the ones in our brain and, and let's say, shuffling these ions in solid state could potentially give us a, a platform that that can capture this long-term potentiation, but at least by using ions that, that we are also working with. And I will come at the very end that, that this can have also other implications beyond computing. Okay, so in this first part of the results, then I will focus on this ion intercalation based um, analog devices, okay? And we're not the first ones to have looked at this. In the last few years, there have been few works that have attempted to use these small ions in devices. Okay? So first one is on the left here, which is using hydrolysis of water in order to insert protons into tungsten oxide. And protonation of tungsten oxide and type dopes it and increases conductivity, as I will come to in our work more extensively too but the working medium is water. So the source of protons is water, and that requires large voltages to split water. And that's not quite in line with the energy efficiency that, that we need. A more recent example is in the middle, which uses lithium. And it's pretty much a solid state lithium battery, lithium ion battery, and electrochemically, you can take lithium from the source into what we call the cathode material or the channel material here, such as lithium cobalt oxide. And that changes the electronic conductivity of lithium cobalt oxide. And that can be used in this pulsing mode as a means to increase the conductance, decrease the conductance of the lithium cobalt oxide. So that's the potentiation, depotentiation that, that we need to represent. But it turns out lithium is not quite desirable in, in current uh, CMOS fabrication platforms because it's volatile and goes into different components. So one needs an alternative. And, and the third example is again with Proton. It's a very nice work that has looked into shuffling electrochemically Proton from, um, from, from between organic electrodes, so organic conducting electrodes, and the amount of hydrogen in that organic layer affects its electron conductivity. And you can see the potentiation up, the potentiation down, and so on. So the range of conductance modulation that could be obtained in this material class is not so large. And, and at the same time, these are organic materials, which are again not compatible with the um, computer uh, platform that we use right now. So maybe they're more compatible for bio applications, but not for computing. So that brings me to what else can we do? And I was really motivated from the proton side and, and like the work here using water, the work here using um, organic electrodes. And how about like putting proton in solid, right? And Petros knows this very well. There are many metals that absorb hydrogen like crazy. So at the same time, I was also studying that topic and that gave me the motivation to look into metal hydrides that could solve this hydrogen source problem for using proton in, in such devices. Okay, so that brings us to the proton device, which we call proton synapse, because we're trying to capture this synaptic potentiation behavior by using proton, but in all solid state. And, and I have collaborated with my colleagues, Julie and Jesus de Lamo on this work, both from the perspective of device design and materials. So why proton? So I've already told you that there are a number of cations that we can work with. Proton in solid state happens to be the smallest cation. And this could come with two advantages. One is 
the stability of the material as you insert and extract proton, that you don't want the material to crumble. And second is that it's the most mobile ion in solid state. So that should then come with energy uh, advantage compared to larger cations. And, and so we can use proton and how can we use it in solid state if we can come up with a solid proton reservoir, right? Or hydrogen reservoir. And so let me first describe the concept on the left where we, we again have literally a solid state battery, but it's a proton battery. We have a reservoir of hydrogen a proton conducting electrolyte and an insulating material into which we want to insert protons. Okay, so we call that the channel material. And um, the two metal contacts here allows us to measure the conductivity of the channel material as we insert protons and extract protons electrochemically. So it's a battery as you apply voltage, top to bottom, electrons follow the external circuit, protons follow the internal circuit. And for the insulating layer that we want to switch, we have used tungsten oxide because I knew this could be protonated from liquid phase chemically. And for the electrolyte, we have adopted nafion, which is at present the fastest proton conductor at room temperature. And for hydrogen source, we have adopted a metal hydride, palladium hydride, as as the reservoir of hydrogen. And the cross section is here. So we're working with relatively thin films. They're not really ideal for making these real devices. You want to go a lot thinner, but this was our starting point. Okay, so having this solid hydrogen source gives us the really good reversibility, controllability, and we can make it into a closed system. Okay, so a bit more on the switching mechanism. So as I said, electrochemically, we can extract protons from the reservoir into a switching material. And we have adopted tungsten oxide. So in principle, as we apply positive voltage to the reservoir, that pulls the electrons out circuit and the protons in circuit and gives them to tungsten oxide. We form hydrogenated tungsten oxide. And that's pretty much going to give us N-type like doping. I will come to the mechanism more in a bit. And as we reverse the bias, we can take the protons and the electrons back and leave behind again, non-hydrogenated tungsten oxide, which is insulating. So let's see if this is working and whether we can capture this permanent potentiation behavior and and yes, so I would not be giving this seminar if that were no at this point, but that here is the first data that we are sending voltage pulses of uh, one microamp that extracts protons from the source into the tungsten oxide. And after each pulse, we can see incremental changes in conductivity of the tungsten oxide. So that's the type of behavior we want, incremental permanent changes after each pulse. And and it's a deterministic process. So unlike the filamentary stochastic process, it's deterministic. Every proton brings one electron. So you can correlate the conductivity change with respect to the proton content in, their, in the material. And we can easily quantify the proton content because we know the current and the charge we are passing. And so up to about 5%, after about 5%, proton insertion into tungsten oxide, the conductivity already changes more than two orders of magnitude, which is quite a range that we can work with. And, and if you span the whole proton concentration regime, so from just as prepared tungsten oxide to one proton or one hydrogen per tungsten oxide, the conductivity change that we can obtain is seven orders of magnitude. So it really gives us a very large range to work with. And I'm not saying necessarily we should work in the whole range, but it does have a big effect in the conductivity that we want to modulate and it's continuous. 
Good. So this gives us thousands of states depending on the sensitivity of your electrical equipment, highly reproducible and, and deterministic, like much more controllable than the filamentary mechanism. And here I want to extend that to the reversibility point to the synaptic potentiation and depression. So as I said, as we stimulate this inorganic synapse after each pulse, we change its conductivity that we call potentiation. So the strengthening of the synapse that eases the signal transmission there. And if you apply the reverse polarization, you can forget, right? So you can start degrading the synaptic strength and increase the resistance and that's the depression behavior. So hydrogen goes in, potentiates the inorganic synapse, hydrogen goes out, depresses the inorganic synapse. And the ability to get this highly reversible like this is important for the reliability of the training of these physical neural networks. Okay, so it has some implications. This very large conductivity regime has some implications for, for device properties. So interestingly, as you can see, the conductivity is not uh, changing in the same way across the whole proton regime. And then I will also explain why this could be happening, but you can see slope changes, different extents of conductivity change per unit amount of change in hydrogen. And, and if you look at this potentiation depression in each of these regimes, they give you different properties. So for example, in the low conductivity regime, the maximum to minimum conductivity change that we can obtain is around 20, or let's say not really low, but around here, okay? And as you do the same experiment in these higher conductivity regimes, you lose that range. And, and so your dynamic range shrinks. And if you look at these different regimes, it's telling us that if you want a larger range in conductivity change with a small amount of proton insertion and extortion, you rather stay in the low conductivity regime. And staying in that low conductivity regime is also good for avoiding leakage in these devices. Okay, so I have motivated the use of proton for these applications based on its potential energy um, consumption being low, right? So do we really get low energy consumption? And we could calculate that even in this rather non-ideal device in terms of its geometry so far, based on our voltage current behavior. And what we get is about 3.5 femtojoule per square micrometer per state, but per state is a bit arbitrary because it depends on the voltage. So if we convert that to per unit change in conductance, it's order of 20 attojoule per square micrometer per nano siemens. So those numbers are very low. And what do they really, like what do they mean? These are so low, like it's very low. <laughs> um, it's not like the fuel cell uh, powers that we're working with, right? And if we, like to make sense of it, if we compare that to energy consumption per synaptic event in the brain, in the synapses, that's on the order of one to 100 femtojoule. So our device giving us order of four femtojoule is actually on the order of the biological brain data processing. So that's very, very exciting for us that use of proton can give us this energy advantage. And and there is more room to improve both in terms of materials and in terms of device configuration. So we are still working on this. So we don't only look at the device aspect, as you know, in our group, we really like to understand the mechanisms. And so we have spent some time also, both experimentally and computationally to resolve how this material is changing its conduction, conductivity upon protonation. 
So tungsten tungstenoxide, which is at which is monoclinic at room temperature, is also an electrochromic material. And so this protonation aspect has also been studied in that field. And the overall view is that proton insertion comes with electrons that fill the 5D T2G band of tungsten, shifts the Fermi level, increases the carrier concentration, and, and thus should increase the conductivity. So what do we see? And in our experiments, first I'm going to show photoelectron spectroscopy looking at the valence band and the tungsten 4F region here. So we can contrast the valence band before and after protonation. And in the latter, we can clearly see the formation of this in-gap state, which is the filling of the tungsten 5D T2G state. And, and the creation of this in-gap state and the shift of Fermi level increases the carrier concentration and the conductivity. And the uptake of electrons by tungsten is also evident in the tungsten 4F spectrum by formation of tungsten 5 plus. We could also see uh, evidence to change in mobility. And, and we are looking at the oxygen K edge spectrum here, switched on states that are switched between protonated and deprotonated tungsten oxide. And, and I won't go into the details, but certain changes in the peak intensities that we see correspond to change in the hybridization between the tungsten and oxygen states that have implications for oxygen mobility. And structure-wise, as we increase the proton content in tungsten oxide, we see an increase in symmetry going from monoclinic to tetragonal tungsten oxide, and this increased crystal symmetry also should have implications on electronic mobility. And we have performed first principles-based calculations to, to convince ourselves indeed that the electronic and structural changes that we are deducing in experiments make sense. And, and here I'm showing the tungsten oxide pristine electronic density of states, which present to us 2.8 EV band gap, which is consistent with the experimental property of this material. As we increase hydrogen concentration, we see the formation of these in-gap states that I've also shown to you experimentally, which are a little bit, so about 0.2 EV lower than the conduction band minimum. And so these states are serving as anti-doping to increase the semiconducting conductivity. As we go to higher concentrations above 10%, the structure becomes metallic, both more symmetric and the electronic density of states represent metallic behavior. So that's consistent with the experimental behavior that we have observed. And, and so we are convinced that at low concentration, the anti-doping and at high concentration, a crystal structure change that turns the material to metallic is taking place. So in summary, for this protonic electrochemical synapse, I've shown to you that we can use something that looks like a solid state proton battery to deterministically control the conductivity of an insulating material by electrochemical proton insertion and extraction. And that gives us the ability to represent the synaptic potentiation and depression behavior which is essential for brain-inspired computing. And I've also shown to you that as we get this behavior, the energy consumption is really, really low. It's literally on the order of biological synapse energy consumption. So that really motivated us to look into this further. And, and I have also shared with you that the switching mechanism for the material that we have chosen involves both the increase of carrier concentration and mobility. And what else to do? So what else are we doing here? That there is a lot to improve on this device yet. In particular, 
upgrading nafion to an inorganic electrolyte so that we don't have to deal with polymer solid polymer in the processing of these devices and Matsumoto is an expert on proton conductors so maybe he can give us more advice here but we have ongoing work that looks promising in this direction and hydrogen being very mobile is a good thing for device efficiency but it's mobile means it likes to go elsewhere too and so you need hydrogen barriers to encapsulate this device to make it a real closed system and we're also working on hydrogen barriers to to uh, improve the durability of these devices good so with that i will move on to the second part for which i have less time left but i think we should be okay where now we will um look at oxygen vacancy conducting filament based resistive switches and how can we make them more reliable and so the main challenge in these filamentary resistive switches is their repeatability is their variability there is too much stochasticity too much variability in the properties that you obtain in these devices that makes it really hard to use them reliably for physical neural networks. So what do we mean by variability? So after you apply a certain voltage, you want to obtain a certain conductance state, but in the same device or from device to device, you apply the same voltage, you get a different conductance each time, right? So that's the variability we mean. So for example, the device to device variability that, that I'm showing in the middle here, depending on the voltage pulse length, can be varying from few fold to nearly two orders of magnitude. So you apply the same voltage, but each time from each device, you get a different conductance. So that makes it very difficult to work with. And that variability has, has implications for the accuracy of these uh, neural networks. So if you have too much variability in your conductance states or in your analog states, then your test, your error of uh, that comes from these physical neural networks becomes unacceptable. So what's the problem here? Right? So the key question for us to improve the variability is to understand where is this filament? How is it forming? Where is it and can we control it? Only by understanding that we can control these filaments and improve the repeatability of these types of devices. So we said a vacancy filament forms, but where is it? It's treated very much stochastically so far in the field. So we're looking into two different approaches to control the um, filament formation. One via microstructure that I will not go into this time. And the other is via doping of the insulating layer by elements that can, that can pin the positions of these vacancies. Okay. So this work is in collaboration with my colleague, Nicholas Fang, also at MIT, and between the two of our students where Nicholas' work has been on the experiments and our work has been on the computation to understand and engineer these devices. So, so Professor Fang and his student had a very interesting experimental observation when they approached us a couple of years ago, where they are using alumina as the insulating electrolyte with a top gold electrode and a bottom tungsten nitride electrode. And they apply voltage to cause conducting filaments and they track the repeatability, right? So if they do two things, that is split this thin layer into even thinner layers, and more importantly, focus ion beam nil through the gold contact layer, they would get beautiful repeatability, especially this fib milling through a metal contact layer seems to make a huge difference. So to de define the device contact, you nil, fib mill, and if you do that before gold, uh, after gold contact, it has a huge implication on the device repeatability. So here are the voltage current data on 
two different devices. One device where the milling is before the gold contact, and as you can see, there is large variability in the in the current voltage behavior. That is large variability in the conductances. And if you do the milling first and then perform the current voltage cycling, then the repeatability is really beautiful. So this is quite impressive, but we were wondering why could this be happening? And the hypothesis we proposed for this is that when you feed mill, you are certainly implanting some gold atoms into the alumina layer. And gold being electronegative, could make it easier for alumina to, to create oxygen vacancies near the implanted gold dopants, forming units of vacancy clusters that could then become filaments or networks that increase the electronic conductivity. And while the initial experimental metal that we considered was gold, since our hypothesis relies on the electron affinity of the implanted dopant, then we have studied a number of different metals with varying electron affinities. So gold, platinum, and palladium being those that have higher electronegativity than some regular transition metals like copper, titanium, and excess aluminum. So we believe the electron affinity of the implanted metal should make a difference in the ability of an insulator like alumina to create oxygen vacancies. So what do we see computationally regarding that vacancy formation uh, difference? So in undoped alumina, oxygen vacancy formation is very costly because aluminum does not want to take up those electrons. The defect states low, very lie. Low, uh, lie very low, and they actually end up being trapped on the oxygen vacancy site. So this is why um, alumina forms like color centers, F centers, upon oxygen vacancy formation. They form trapped electrons like aluminum, and the conduction band of alumina does not easily take these electrons as you remove the oxygen. On the other hand, if you insert gold or platinum or palladium, you can see a substantial decrease in the oxygen vacancy formation energy, which indicates that we should be able to more easily create oxygen vacancies in the vicinity of these implanted highly electronegative metals. And they have implications for the electronic structure. So the two key points is that when you have gold or platinum or palladium, they create in-gap states that can uptake that electron that is left from oxygen. And that's going to be very important, okay? And the other is that there is change in the amount of charge on the aluminum and oxygen when you have gold nearby. So when you put gold nearby, both aluminum and oxygen loses charge. So mostly oxygen loses charge. That means you are also weakening the aluminum oxygen bonds and that electron goes on to gold. So you have electron that likes to go on to gold, both with and without oxygen vacancy. And especially with oxygen vacancy, this makes a very big difference because now you have these low lying states that can uptake the electron after you create the oxygen vacancy, unlike the F center of undoped aluminum. So electronegative ions, when you insert them into alumina, they can uptake the electron left from oxygen as you create oxygen vacancy, and this makes the material more easy to reduce when you apply voltage. And Expansion beyond individual vacancy is also important to look at because in the end, when you are creating these oxygen vacancy filaments, it's not just one oxygen vacancy, but clusters of oxygen vacancies that must form. And we can see that both the formation energy of clusters of oxygen vacancies around gold, platinum, palladium, as well as their binding is more preferential. 
So not only individual oxygen vacancy, but cluster of oxygen vacancies become more favorable to form, and they are strongly binding to the vicinity of the implanted gold, palladium, and platinum in comparison to regular transition metals. So this implies that, that when you implant electronegative ions into alumina, they can act as building blocks for vacancy cluster formation that then becomes building blocks for conducting filaments or networks of filaments to induce switching. And we can again look at this vacancy cluster and its implication on the local electronic structure. Here is alumina, wide band gap, alumina, undoped with a vacancy cluster that is hard to form, but those vacancy clusters comes with defect states. And alumina with gold and with vacancy cluster has even more defect states. And moreover, these clusters become more easy to form in the presence of gold. Very similar picture again with platinum and palladium. So you are really forming a building block of, of conducting um, cluster here that can then percolate to become your conducting path or conducting network. So, so we could see this theoretically that gold, platinum, and palladium should improve your um, repeatability based on ease of creating these oxygen vacancies and vacancy clusters, and regular transition metals should not be as good, right? And we could validate this theoretical finding experimentally. So now we are looking at on the left again the current voltage cycling data and the, the cumulative density functions of the resistance states that we obtain high and low resistance states so the sharper these curves the more repeatable the conductances that we obtain and the more widespread these curves the worse the repeatability and indeed, the better repeatability in these experiments are obtained by the electronegative ions that we implant, palladium, gold, platinum, and the regular transition metals do not help as much. So in summary, this is consistent with the ease of oxygen vacancy formation that I have shown theoretically in the previous slides. So, so there is a path for improving the repeatability of these devices if you know what type of ions to dope with in a given uh, in a given insulating material so again in summary for this part if your material to switch through is alumina a material that does not like to create oxygen vacancies like many other insulators in fact it's helpful to implant highly electronegative metals that make it easier to create oxygen vacancies and oxygen vacancy clusters. These ions serve as binding sites for those oxygen vacancy clusters that create local conducting zones and, and preferentially conducting zones. So preferentially located near the implanted dopants. And that's what we believe is giving rise to the much enhanced repeatability. So that's what I wanted to share on the oxygen vacancy side, devices that switch with that mode. So if we think forward, so based on what I have shared in the first part, we are very excited about these ion-based resistive switches because they are not filamentary, they are not stochastic, they're really deterministic charge controlled devices, which we know how to modulate electrochemically. So our field of solid state ionics, solid state electrochemistry knows how to control those devices and they present really promising energy efficiency and the properties that we have obtained are also very promising for analog computing applications. And there are more ions to, to work with. It's not just protons. So we started with protons for the potential energy gain, but as I said at the beginning, our brains don't work with protons. It works with 
other ions like calcium, sodium, potassium, those who like to eat yogurt, maybe Petros, should see a difference, like you become more focused when, when you eat yogurt, right? And, and so if we come up with ways to actually work with these devices, so we know also magnesium, calcium, sodium batteries exist, right? So if we can come up with such devices that actually use the neurotransmitter ions, maybe in the very long term, we can reverse the goal, not just brain-inspired computing, but can we use such devices that use the neurotransmitter ions to assist with certain brain injuries on, in the very long run, right? So I know nothing about that, but, but a direction that, that uh, interests me lately. So on the oxygen vacancy based filamentary devices, so these materials and devices are more mature. So I don't want to say that just because they are stochastic and less deterministic than the iron based ones, we should not study them. So they're already more mature. Some of the materials that are used there, like alumina, hafnia, are already like well known how to make, how to use in the computing area. So if we then come up with ways that rely on solid state ionics and how to control and engineer ionic defects, as I've shown, there can be ways to much improve their repeatability, predictability that also makes these devices viable for analog and brain-inspired computing. And so I will end with thanking all of you again for having me share our work in this webinar and, and thank you again for that. And I also would like to thank my colleagues again, in particular, as a the Lama and Julie, as well as our postdocs and students who worked on the particular results that I've shared with you, and, and Nicholas Fang and our students who worked on the latter oxygen vacancy mechanism. And again, thank you so much for listening and, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk. And by, how do you say, bio-inspired resistive switch. And what I'm surprised, one, one of the aspects I'm surprised is that uh, you use very common material to fabricate very nice device, alumina, tungsten oxide, um, yes. nafion. Uh, they, the materials are all common you use, but the result is quite ex excellent, very exciting. So it is one of the aspects I was surprised. And many Thank people, you. many audience uh, will have uh, questions to you. So now the seminar is open, move to the discussion. And in this case, I'd like to recall uh, all the audience uh, several aspects. One is that we are um, the ICNR is recording the seminar and the video will be published later in the ICNR website. So please understand this feature. And also the chat function is disabled due to the, uh, because of the safety reason. And in replace, uh, we can use the raised hand function you can find in the participant list. So please raise your hand and then I will find the questioner uh, to ask you ask the questions. So right now, John Sok, uh Hi. good morning john sok you you have you are raising your hand so please Hi, speak your question okay let me make a quick question thank uh thanks for a nice talk in your proton part the there is a conductivity relaxation behavior after this kind of gitt right experiment very good yes so good. how how can you explain how we understand this relaxation and does this relaxation affect the device based on this kind of a concept? Yeah, so you have very careful eyes and that's a very important observation. So thank you for this question. So this is the relaxation you are asking about, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. So after each pulse, we change the conductivity, but it relaxes, right? And that relaxation has to do with the diffusion, redistribution of protons in the, in the tungsten oxide layer. So once you protonate and open the circuit, protons don't go back. They are in the tungsten oxide layer, 
but they diffuse two ways, from the electrolyte interface to the depth of tungsten oxide and between the source and drain electrodes. Uh, so if you look at our geometry, uh, yeah. Yeah. we are comparing yeah. between like the reservoir and one of these metal contacts, right? So okay. there, especially in the insulating state, there can be a distribution of proton display. So there is a relaxation. So, so can you, maybe uh, it's a, I was interested in the how to measure, right? It depends on the, uh, uh, how you measure conductivity, right? It depends on the path. So I think yes. this high conductivity is due to kind of short circuiting effect of the, uh, the layer. So that you are like measuring parallel mode, you know, then the conductivity no, is no the short circuit. Yeah, so these two metal contacts that we call source and drain is what we measure conductivity through. So tungsten oxide, as we protonate it, there is proton insertion. Oh. And as we cut the circuit, there is redistribution of proton so, into the depth and also laterally. Why so is that relaxation you are seeing? Usually, I would imagine the increase of conductivity, the relaxation, but you see the decrease of conductivity now. Yeah, so I think it's parallel paths, right? So it's Maybe a it's very highly conducting zone uh -huh. here. It's kind of short We're measuring that, but it's then diluting as it diffuses. It. I, I that's see. Okay, yeah. thank you. It will be good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then it's not good for, is it, it's a shorter, the best, the better, right? The relaxation, should be, the relaxation should be uh, shorter. Yes, the relaxation oh. should be shorter. Mm -hmm. And as I said, like, we don't have a ideal geometry yet. I mean, it's 50 nanometers, but it should be more like less than 10 nanometers in thickness. So that's the diffusion length. And also the, the lateral diffusion, like this, this lateral size is huge. We're working with like microns of device. It's the the relaxation depends on the, the other direction. Both, it depends on both directions because we are able to polarize top to one of the bottom electrodes and that biases the proton distribution uh -huh. towards one electrode. Okay. So it should be both narrow and thin. Okay. And, uh -huh. and my colleague Jesus de Lamo is an expert in miniaturizing such devices. So that's what we are working with him on next, like come up with device configurations that that can help eliminate that long time relaxation. Okay, thank you. I'm done. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, any questions? So, Bilge, I have some technical questions, but before that, uh, the common question is that uh, how are you sure about the applicability of your switch to the real computing? So, in other words, do you assume any practical application or uh, co how do you say commercialization or uh, of your device to the real computer? Yeah, so as you know, like my lab does not produce real devices. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these right. are prototype devices, we come up with materials and mechanisms. And I was just very motivated to start <laughs> studying this field and so I did, but now we are supported by industry, mm -hmm. including IBM and the Semiconductor Research Consortium. So, so there is a clear path and interest for these type of devices for applications of analog computing. So these physical neural networks that I have shown to you is, um, is a big development field in the industry. And, and so our work is supported by industry right now. And of course, both we are learning, they are learning, and I cannot say like, this is exactly how it will be implemented, but it's a motivating platform for applications of analog computing. Okay, okay, very great. And another technical question I'd like to make you is that show in the latter part of your seminar, uh, <laughs> the dispersion of some metals into alumina. Yes. And in this case, I'm wondering if the, how do you say, the nano ionics effect, or in other words, space charge formation, or the charge transfer between the metal and alumina is taking place or not? Yeah, 
So in that case, your calculation yeah. is based on the neutral uh, charge, neutral or neutrality of the charge, but uh, due to the transfer between the dispersed metal and the lumina, uh, some part is negatively charged, some part is positively charged, possibly. Do you think, do you have any idea for the effect of such charge transfer between the two phases? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, it's, it's an interesting question, but I did not think we are dealing with space charge because we are literally implanting these ions. And if you look at our, I didn't show it here, but simulated results of ion implantation, it's right. through the whole layer. Okay. And so I don't think we have like a very thin gold layer here separated from the undo zone. So it goes through and in fact, it also implants even deeper. Mm. So it is dispersion of the dopant into the alumina. I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. Mm -hmm. But yes, there is charge transfer, but at the atomic level, that's what I tried to okay. refer to. That. So if you mm -hmm. don't have any dopant, the charge, the excess electron, stays at the oxygen vacancy, this F center. And that's very difficult to, f that's why this type of vacancy formation er energy is very high in alumina. But if you have electronegative dopants that are inserted, then they take up the charge. So there is charge transfer mm. from what used okay. to be okay. if it's type of alumina to gold or to platinum or to pearl. Okay, okay, it is taking There is local account. charge. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Questions or ah yes so Koji good morning Ko Koji Amazawa uh, please make the question hi good morning hi Koji hi Vyuge. very nice to see you nice to see you also yeah so thank you very much for very exciting talks so your talk thank today you. inspired me very very much. So okay. yeah. I have a lot of questions actually, but I like to start uh, more basic uh, aspect of your work. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, especially uh, in the second part of your talks, I'm very curious uh, for your findings uh, that is the oxygen vacancy are uh, easy to be formed near the uh, gold particles in the oxide. So my first question is, uh, is such a things happens only in the aluminum oxide? or also happens to the other conventional oxide as well? Yeah, so that's a good question. So in, in alumina, I think this is quite prominent because alumina is very difficult to form oxygen vacancies in and it likes to form these F centers, right? So the defect state energies are <coughs> very low, uh, way lower than conduction. Band. So it's, it, it is, it's an oxide that is very difficult to put electrons into, like aluminum doesn't like to take electrons, right? And, and the defect states are far from conduction band and you cannot put them into the conduction band either. Yeah. So if the oxide is like alumina, and if you insert one of these electronegative ions into it, it helps. So then I can generalize that if the oxide that you're working with forms F centers, then mm -hmm. these Electronegative ions should also reduce the vacancy formation energy in them. But such a situation is also same to the other ion shrating. Like hafnia, zirconia, I agree. Yeah. They should also be helped by this. So have you tried to similar experiment with the other oxide? We have not yet, but we will with hafnia. Okay. So other question is, so you, you, you discussed the uh, formation energy with oxygen vacancies. But uh, well, sometimes you know that easy formation of the oxygen vacancy doesn't mean too easy to move. Um, uh, to move. I mean, uh, sometimes oxygen vacancy traps by gold particles, for instance, in your case. Yeah, yeah. So here so we how are the mobility of the oxygen? Like bound there. Mm. Uh, but how about the uh, mobility of the oxygen vacancies mm -hmm. in your uh, oxide? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but, but let me see. Okay, so we would see some implication of that in the, in the electrical data because it should reflect to the voltages that we are switching the material with, right? So both the um, 
like if the mobility was lower, yeah. I think we would have to go to higher voltages to switch. Because of the low conductivity. Yes. Yeah. And and I don't see that too prominently. So my question is, even though it's you you have the oxygen vacancy near the I don't the, I don't have that data. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Say it again. Yeah, so my question is, if you have the oxygen vacancy near the gold particles, but uh, that those vacancy doesn't, uh, is not mobile, you don't have the yeah. switching. I mean, you just have to apply more voltage to move it, right? So how much more field you need to move it. Okay. That, that's so what it changes. means it depends on the uh, applied voltage to the system. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So these both form and move under quite high electric fields through very thin layers, right? Mm -hmm. And and so you would have to go to higher voltage or higher field correspondingly to be able to migrate the electro migrate the ion. Yeah, okay. Can I have one more question? Of course, yeah. Uh, so or, I, I mean, moderator is <laughs> Matsumoto, so he can, he can tell me. Yes, you, it's okay. Okay. you can, you can. Okay. So I'm also wondering uh, the uh, response time of your devices. So if you use the ionic mo uh, motion uh, to the switching devices, mm -hmm. so you always have, may, you may probably have the uh, problem from response time. So how first your uh, switching device works compared with the uh, electronic switching devices? Um, the proton one, right? You're asking uh, in about. both case, in both case. Yeah. Okay. So both of them are switched by millisecond pulses because that's what we are limited to in our electrical device. Mm -hmm. So I cannot say what is their real switching speed. Okay. Uh, do you think but, it's enough? But, okay. So I think so. So in our experiments, we are able to switch with milliseconds, right? Uh -huh. But these lithium devices that were that are being experimented by IBM, they are able to switch very fast on the order of nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. You don't need to move too many ions. So <laughs> the pulse duration can be very short and you just insert very few ions and they, they change the conductivity discernibly. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, so very a nice talk. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Koji, and thank you, Ringe. So the next question is, Ryan, can you, can you talk? Can you make a question? Yes. Hello, yes, thank Hello you. Ryan. Thank you, Professor Mara. Thank yes. you for joining from Colorado. And Bilge, thank so, you so much for a wonderful seminar. Uh, fascinating. Yeah. I learned a lot. So, so will you Ryan. will you will you turn on the camera so that we all the all the people can see you? Oh yeah, I'm afraid I'm I'm just at home. It's in the evening. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, but great. Really yeah, nice I'm also. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a single dad right now. My wife is a, a medical doctor, and she's actually on call with hospitals oh. and quarantined for COVID wow. away from home just to be safe. So I'm dealing with both kids and science at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> Good luck. Yes, stay safe. So, Bilga, my question for you is on the proton, proton synapse. Um, you, you described how a proton being the most mobile ion leads to higher energy efficiencies. So... I guess the, the potential downside of that is um, in terms of permanence. Yes. So when you uh, want to program a state, how permanent is that state? And, you know, so if I want my proton synapse to remember something for 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, can it do that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a good question. I can repeat our point there. So in principle, yes, because as you open the circuit, electrons have nowhere to go and so protons also have nowhere to go but we know hydrogen likes to move around and there are metal contacts right so one challenge with proton could be the long-term durability like long-term retention ability we didn't test too long term i mean with our like rudimentary encapsulation we could demonstrate order of a day and and it's just demonstration, but we know that that could be a potential limitation. So we are working on potential hydrogen encapsulation layers on these devices, such as alumina layers. And so those are very strongly hydrogen blocking layers. And, and one way to increase the endurance could be, or increase the 
retention could be using such layers. Yeah, I suppose it could also be like a real memory where uh, if I want to remember a fact, I have to think about it every day. So oh, maybe, maybe you, you have have to a, re-stimulate a little bit more, right? Yes, you yeah, have to exactly. refresh the synapse. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, what makes us forget is other environmental stimulations there and, and maybe hydrogen loss would be one of them. Yes, right. <laughs> that's a very but, interesting but, point. But this could also be a way to further simulate true biology and true learning because mm -hmm. if, you know, depending on the algorithm that is kind of uh, exploring these synapses, um, <laughs> if, if things are really important, they will continue to be reinforced over and over and the, the uh, you know, the synapse will be strengthened and this new state will be strengthened. But things that are be, uh, occur less frequently or aren't as important won't be strengthened and they'll eventually be forgotten by the network of synapses, just like a, you know, a real brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting point and a positive way to look at this retention <laughs> challenge. <Right. laughs> yes. Thank you. I'll Thank keep you, that in Thank you, Ryan. Very interesting question. And yes. in my experience, my dog forget everything in six seconds. <laughs> So it is uh, a kind of different uh, aspect of your device, I think. So the next question I can accept is, uh, Kian Du? Yeah, yes. Yeah, please make your question. Kian or Chan Du? Yeah, it's, yeah. Mr. Lu? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, Professor Yudis. Very nice talk. Haven't seen you a long time in person. Yes, I'm so yes. happy that, um, that you participate. Yeah. yeah, one of my friends sent me this uh, uh, Zoom link, so I'm here. Uh, Thanks. Very nice talk. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. Uh, now, Chia is my previous PhD student, and I'm sure he's going okay. to ask me a very hard question. Okay. <laughs> no, not quite, yeah. So, basically, a follow up question to Ryan's question. So, essentially, what you have is a part on battery. So do you worry yes. that um, uh, the retention will be limited by self-discharge uh, as battery? We all know that a battery cannot hold charge for, you know, uh, cannot hold charge permanently. Well, uh, finally, you will lose the charge through the electrolyte. When you miniaturize the, uh, the battery, your synapse, so do you worry that the retention time will be shorter and shorter? So in uh, related to that, there has been some work uh, from Ian Lee, uh, you know, now he's in Michigan, uh, using oxygen vacancies as, you know, mobile, you know, mobile ionic species for synapses. Uh, do you see any future in that? Or what, what's your opinion on that development? Um, you mean the, the, um, the charge loss in the battery, which would be the um, retention loss in this device. Can it be yes. used for, for, for the, yeah. So, so similar to Ryan's question, right? I have not thought about that in, in that way. I mean, we were just trying to improve the retention, right? For this particular application. But maybe like you said, I mean, I'm more familiar with it from the oxygen vacancy area, mm -hmm. right? There the relaxation is more, more evident and I think quicker than, than these proton batteries. Mm -hmm. It ought to be quicker. No, maybe, maybe it gives a mm -hmm. possibility like you can use in the same network different ions and that have different different uh, retention behavior and so different forgetting behavior without stimuli and that could allow to simulate different environments maybe maybe so this is very interesting like both you and ryan are pointing to the same thing i think something that I have not thought about before, but I will think more, yeah. So like that retention loss could be one way to emulate the environment. And, and what we put around this proton battery could be one way to calculate or one way to, to alter that retention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks to both you and Ryan for that. Matsumoto, I think you are muted. Sorry. 
Kwati, Kwati Leonard, you are the next questioner. You're welcome to make question. All right, okay. Thank you, Bill, there for the wonderful talk. Thank uh, you. I have a question, okay, yeah, this slide is fine. Uh, especially on the device front here, uh, looking at uh, <coughs> tungsten oxide. I guess this was deposited by PLD or something. Spot string. Uh, or spotting or something. Uh, mm -hmm. What about the stoichiometry of the oxygen? Yes, yeah, Tons that's a very good question also, yes. So after we sputter, we annihilate in oxygen at low temperature to make sure it, it has oxidized as fully as we could. So, but if we don't, then the tungsten oxide starts more conducting yes. or depending on what oxygen pressure we have in the chamber or in annealing, it starts with different conductance and then it has different conductance ranges it can span with protonation. So it does mm -hmm. have an impact. So you need to control the oxygen stoichiometry because it does affect the electronic conductivity of tungsten. Yes, yes, yes. That is where I was trying to. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's a good point. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, uh, what about the protons? How, I don't exactly know how you in, um, individually control cross-check the protons in the respective layers, like nafium and the ceramic layer. How do you get the protons, control the protons within these other layers? Mm -hmm. So nafium needs some hydration first before it becomes good proton conductor. Mm -hmm. and, and nevertheless, that's just the proton path. So we get the protons from this reservoir, which we use yes. as a metal hydride. And, and as we apply positive potential to this metal hydride, it extracts hydrogen out of it in the form of protons through the device and electrons through the outer circuit. So just like a battery, just like when you extract lithium from the anode into the cathode in your battery. We are doing that for the proton. Oh. So you apply voltage or current that takes the protons from the inner path from the metal hydride layer through the electrolyte into the tungsten oxide. And if you reverse, you apply negative, then protons and electrons go back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That will be all for myself. Yeah. Thank you, Kwati. Nicola, uh, good evening. So will Hi. you make questions? Hi, Bill. Thanks for the great talk. It's nice to see you and see everyone. Thank you. So nice to see you. Yeah, mini reunion of sorts. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is about the tungsten oxide as well. Um, so I know it's been studied for like a really long time for electrochromics and things. And I'm curious about this phase transition and just from a practical standpoint, is that problematic um, in terms of device durability? Is there like volume changes? And is there any motivation to maybe look at a similar material that does not undergo a phase change? Yes. I get that it yeah. helps the conductivity, but. Yeah, yeah. So that that's also a very good question. So the phase change we are seeing is after 10 So if you are staying in this dilute regime, mm -hmm. it's very stable. And uh, like in the um, XRD, the lattice parameter change we see is very, very small. Okay. So you do not have to go to this very high protonation regime. I mean, you don't need seven order. If you look at like desirable device characteristics, even if you get order, like one order of magnitude change, as long as you can fit many states into it, it's good enough, right? So if we stay in this dilute protonation regime, the material is stable, the lattice parameter change is not much, there is no phase change, and you can run there many cycles. Okay, very good. I actually had a, maybe a fundamental question about this plot since you brought it up, um, yeah. which is just the open circuit potential obviously will be sensitive to the phase change 
but I'm curious okay. if some of these other changes are due to like the redistribution of the, the protons spatially. Yes. Like so, that relaxation. I mean, not just redistribution, but concentration. Sure, so is, sensitive to the activity, yeah. right? Yeah. And you'll see the phase boundaries and the yes. slopes. So the changes in the slopes are consistent with yeah. the changes in the conductivity slope. So those right. should be where there is phase change. So the changes before slope changes are concentration change. But even the redistribution, yes, can change yeah. the effect that can be. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thank Any you. other questions? I I found John Hall. A good uh, good morning. So you have once once unmute your microphone. Do you have any question? John Hall E. John Hall D. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, nice hi. to see you. Nice to see hi. you. Yeah. See but, you. Uh, the, yeah. The, the question that I actually wanted to give is already been done by Cozy. <laughs> so I, oh. I, I yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that uh, it is very nice lectures. Uh, thank you very much for you. Yeah. A nice talk. Thank you so much. Okay, anyway, Very nice yeah. to see. <laughs> uh, John Ho, thank you to be present. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Even you have already done your question. It is very nice uh, opportunity yeah, for to see each that. other. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So any other guy, do you have any questions? If not, in that case, uh, the time is already exceeding uh, many yes, minutes. Yes, yes Petros. Can I ask a question? Very yes, simple. of course, of course. Bilge, thank you again. Thank you for this fascinating talk. I, thank you. I cannot uh, claim that I understood everything, right? <laughs> but thank you. Yes. I, I saw the directions, I saw the future, especially when uh, in the end you suggested that we do reverse engineering, right? Help the brain yes. by using yes. electrochemistry, our own electrochemistry, yes. that very futuristic, really. Yes, really. I really hope to learn and do something in that direction. Yeah, societal impact, right? <laughs> so my question is uh, simple, of course. At some point, you, at the beginning of your first uh, part of your talk, you, you extract uh, hydrogens out of palladium hydride, and then you return them when you reverse the bias. Now, is that process reversible? I mean, can, can how, how, uh, for how long you can continue it? Uh, from my own understanding is when you create hydrides in palladium, you, you induce uh, a volume dilatation that is something uh, of the order of 10%, if I remember well. In fact, as you were talking, I, I just pulled one of my books here. Yes, <laughs> yes, my yes. Books. So I know you are going to. So you are right, with palladium hydride, there is a large volume change. And so I will tell the story ongoing right now also, that what made us be able to work in the current device is that the electrolyte we used was polymer. So even if it is expanding, contracting, polymer was able to comply. And so okay. we were very lucky with this, okay? Okay, so, all right. As I said, so this one worked, right? With polymer, it worked because it's able to accommodate the expansion contraction. Mm. So now we wanted to move beyond the polymer electrolyte to inorganic electrolytes, which are not compliant. And that's where we started having challenges with the palladium hydride stability because like you said, it expands contracts too much. So one way that we are able to have it work is by making it very thin at the moment. So that also seems to have helped. And we are also looking into ways to stabilize it by alloying. So for that hydrogen source, indeed we are looking into works like yours for, for choosing the um, good metal hydrides. I see, okay. Yeah. We can help you, you know, no. at Eisner, we have a strong uh, <laughs> Uh, research group there that deals with these types of problems, right? Yes, Interfaces. That is also for the hydrogen barrier layers, right? If yeah. you want the return, yeah. return, you really need to barrier it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank well. you. Okay, uh, thank you, Petros. And thank you, thank you for all the questioners. So right now, uh, it is almost time we should close this seminar. 
So I think, I believe this is very, very satisfactory seminar, satisfactory seminar for all the people. And I think not only the content of the seminar we learned from Bilge, but also this is a good opportunity for meeting each other, seeing each yes. other. And that's why we are using the meeting style of this seminar. This is the Zoom meeting and we can choose the meetings, meeting style or conference style. However, meeting style is much better to see each other. So we will continue uh, this style. And also ISNA will continue uh, holding this webinar. Uh, and the next webinar will be planned in January. So please, I would not like to ask all the people to keep in touch with the website of ISNA and ISNA will advertise you again for the next webinar. So Vilge, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for fantastic seminar, fantastic talk and fantastic discussion. So- thank you so much. Thank you so much again for hosting me and, and thank you everyone for listening and discussing. I really appreciated yeah, it. Yeah, quite, quite very enjoyable time. Very, very enjoyable time. So I'm very sorry, but I should close this seminar right now. So I'd like to ask all the people to have a nice day, have a, have a good day or have a good evening. And I'd like to close the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take good Thank care you. and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.